much better chance of supplying the student exactly what he or she needs. Probably the worst problem, though, with the grammatical syllabus is that it's boring. It's very hard to present messages that are interesting and comprehensible to people when our hidden agenda is the relative clause or any other rule. What we're now saying is if we give people messages that are interesting and comprehensible, grammar to a large extent takes care of itself. And as most of us who've taught language know, this is easily difficult enough. A final hypothesis will conclude the brief review of fundamental aspects of the theory for us. It's called the affective filter hypothesis, a term I borrowed from Dulé and Burt. Uh, to go over this hypothesis, I first need to give you a very brief review of what we know about affective variables. The research has shown us to, I think, no one's great surprise that motivation counts in language acquisition. This is, of course, uh, a well-researched area, and I'm only going to give you the tip of the iceberg. Uh, students who are more motivated do better in language acquisition, and this is uh, to be expected. Self-esteem also counts. Those who are better in self-esteem, who have better self-image, do better in language acquisition. Uh, I've noted that self-esteem is a dominant concept today in uh, popular psychology, and it's no surprise to see it here as well in language acquisition. There's also a relationship between anxiety and language acquisition. Very simply, the lower the anxiety, the better the language acquisition. It's a negative correlation. My suspicion is for language acquisition to really proceed optimally, anxiety should be zero. Now, this has happened to some of us. If you've been in a situation where you're so involved in speaking another language, a language you may not control very well, that you temporarily forget that you're dealing with another language, when anxiety is temporarily zero, when you're totally focused on the message, that's when you're acquiring. Now, just uh, a footnote before I go on. A uh, misunderstood point about anxiety, I think. I don't think it uh, necessarily applies to everything. I think it applies to language acquisition, but uh, perhaps it has its limits. As a parent, as a uh, university teacher, I'm not particularly progressive. I think that children in elementary school should learn their multiplication tables, uh, no nonsense. I think that graduate students in my program at the University of Southern California should suffer, as graduate students should. In other words, I've finally learned what uh, they tried to teach me in educational psychology all those years ago, that the amount of anxiety or drive it takes to accomplish a task depends on the task. Some things require what we call facilitative anxiety. I don't believe in torture, but sometimes a little anxiety is good. Language acquisition, though, is different. For language acquisition, the pressure has to be off entirely. Frank Smith, in his discussion of what he calls sensitivity, says something very similar, and I think says it very well. He says, for language acquisition to succeed, the acquirer, he's speaking of children, I think it's true of everyone, has to assume he's going to be successful. The way we integrate this into the theory is this. If the student isn't motivated, if self-esteem is low, if anxiety is high, if the student is on the defensive, to borrow a phrase from Earl Stevick, if he thinks the language class is a place where his weaknesses will be revealed, not a place where he'll get new input, a block goes up. We call this block the affective filter. When the filter is up, the student may understand the input, but the input won't reach those parts of the brain that do language acquisition. The block will keep it out. Somewhere in the brain, according to Chomsky, is a language acquisition device. For acquisition to happen, comprehensible input must enter the language acquisition device. If the student isn't motivated, if anxiety is high, self-esteem is low, a block will keep this data, this comprehensible input, out. Acquisition will not occur. This explains how it can be that we can have two students in the same class, both getting the same comprehensible input. In one case, there's acquisition. In another case, there isn't. In one case, the child is open to the input. In the other case, the block keeps it out. Let me now summarize in, in a minute what just took me 20 minutes to say. 
We acquire language in one way, when we get comprehensible input in a low anxiety situation. Now, if this is true, we then have to consider how we should teach it. Uh, the first question that comes up is whether we even need language classes at all. Uh, most people say no. Most people don't believe in language classes. And if I phrase the question correctly, I'm sure that some of you will find yourself not believing in language classes. Let's say, for example, that you're at a party. Someone discovers that you're interested in language, and of course they say to you, you know, I've always wanted to learn, let's say, uh, French. What do we tell them? Go to the local school and take French one. Go to the university and take beginning French. Go to the private language school and take beginning French. We don't say that. We say things like, go to France. Go to Canada. Go to Quebec. Go to the country. It seems reasonable, but it's bad advice. Let me give you my situation. Even though I live in Los Angeles, California, I don't speak Spanish. Que lastima. What would happen if I went to Mexico, which is two and a half hours away, to try to learn to speak Spanish? I wouldn't understand anything. It would simply be noise. It would be a waste of time. But if I went to a well-taught Spanish class, a ta class taught correctly, the first day I could get 45 minutes of comprehensible input. That's what language classes are for. Language classes are designed to give you the comprehensible input that the outside world can only give you with great difficulty. The beginner belongs in a language class. A beginner can get more from two days in a language class than a week or two in the country. Now, let's say I take two, three semesters, say 50 to 100 hours of comprehensible input Spanish, then I go to Mexico. It's a different story. I can understand a little bit. I can understand when people speak to me. I can have conversations, which are very good ways of getting comprehensible input. I can read a little bit. I can then use the outside world to get more comprehensible input. The goal of the language class, then, is to put you in a position so you can go to the outside world and get more comprehensible input. Now, when I first get to Mexico, after two or three semesters, my Spanish will not be perfect. I'll make mistakes. The goal of the language class, of the beginning language class, is not to make you perfect. The goal of the language class is to make you an intermediate, so you can then get more comprehensible input from the outside world. Now, in case you think this is a, uh, a lowering of standards, I think it's nothing more or less than a common sense philosophy of education we all subscribe to. When those of us who are out in the field finished our university, our college language training, of course, we weren't the polished professionals we are today. If your career has been anything like mine, I've learned three times as much every year on the outside as I did all through college, of course. But my university training was necessary. Without it, I could never have begun my career as a professional professor and uh, researcher. The same thing is true with the elementary language class. The outside world is more valuable. Acquisition will come faster on the outside. But our goal is to put students in a position so they can take advantage of the input on the outside. Just a brief review of what's going on now from my point of view in elementary language teaching. At the elementary level, I think there are some fine methods that do what they're supposed to do. They provide comprehensible input in a low anxiety situation. And from what I can tell in reading reports in the professional literature, these are the superior methods. Students are doing better in these methods than they do in grammar programs, what we call drill and kill programs. Uh, the methods that seem to work, where there is a lot of comprehensible input, uh, low anxiety, etc. Uh, the one I've been connected with is Tracy Terrell's natural approach. Uh, James Asher's total physical response method is another one, and Professor Asher has, I think, collected massive uh, empirical evidence in favor of his method. And again, I think it works basically because it provides comprehensible input. I'm uh, very positive about Suggestopedia, Lozanov's method developed in Bulgaria. Again, the, uh, in fact, the research reports I've read from the United States uh, confirms, confirm that it's a good method. I think it uh, goes a long way toward lowering the affective filter and providing comprehensible input. As good as these methods are, they're probably not enough. 
they don't bring students to the point where they can actually use the language on the outside in uh, sophisticated situations, in academic situations. As a method of supplementing the language class, we have borrowed an idea from the successful Canadian immersion programs and have been teaching subject matter in a comprehensible way to language students. Just to give you an idea, an experiment we did at the University of Ottawa uh, a couple of years ago, it appears in the Canadian Modern Language Review, uh, with uh, published, co-authored with Henry Edwards, Mari Vesha, and uh, Richard Clement. We took English-speaking students and French-speaking students at the University of Ottawa, a bilingual university, and taught them psychology in their second language, in their weaker language. The English students took psychology courses in French. The French students took it in English. These were students who were not very advanced, but they weren't beginners in the second language. We found that the students not only learned as much psychology as comparison students, they improved their language competence very satisfactorily. And it was just the kind of improvement we hope of academic English, academic French, that will help them survive in a regular class. So, in other words, they got lectures in psychology made comprehensible in the second language, and they acquired language and subject matter at the same time. Other people have since uh, confirmed our results. All right, this is the basic outline of the theory. There's a great deal more to it, but I think these are the fundamentals. I'd just like to conclude with some comments on what the difficulties are. As I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, there are two major difficulties in acceptance. One is our students, the second is us. Our students expect grammar. Our students expect vocabulary lists. Our students expect exercises. And very often, when we don't provide a great deal of grammar, they think it's a sign of professional incompetence on our part. I can think of a couple of solutions to this. First of all, I'd like to uh, go back on what I've said in a couple of my previous uh, works. I recommended a little tongue-in-cheek that we engage in deception. We teach our students in the target language, but we teach them grammar, teach them vocabulary, give them what they want. And regardless of their personal philosophy of language acquisition, they will acquire because they're getting comprehensible input, because it's being done in the second language. Uh, a former colleague of mine, Steve Sternfeld, who's now at the University of Utah, uh, forced me to change my position. He argued that this is not the way to go. He said that what does it matter if a student has gained a certain amount of proficiency in a second language if he doesn't know how he got it? Our goal, Sternfeld argued in his dissertation, is not only to teach language, but to teach students how to acquire language so that they can become autonomous and improve on their own. So Sternfeld has convinced me that our goal is not simply language acquisition, but to inform our students about the process of language acquisition so they can become autonomous. The second problem is us. For language professionals, acquisition and learning are very, very different. For people like us, acquisition seems slow. Learning seems very quick. For people like us who are familiar with grammar, we can pick up a grammar book of a language we don't know very well and get a good feeling for the grammar of a language in several hours. It seems to come quickly. Of course, I've argued this information is not available to us in actually using the language. Second, acquisition seems subtle. Learning seems very concrete. You can touch it. You can taste it. For people like us, Learning is pleasant. We like it. I'll never forget when I learned consciously, which wasn't very long ago, the subjunctive in French. Every time I say the subjunctive correctly, I rekindle the victory of having first consciously learned it. Il faut que j'aille. Of course, it's not there when I need it. What we have to remember, I think, is that normal people get their pleasures elsewhere. Right, I'm ready now.